And to me, it mm -hmm. just feels fundamentally like why, right? Like I, I get this idea that having something be fixed is what people are used to. I don't get this idea that unless things are the way people have known them to be, their brain is going to collapse into a black hole and they're not going to be able to function in there. <laughs> so welcome back to the channel, everyone. Today, we are talking to the one and only Aaron Warwick. He is from Alluvium, as you guys know. He's one of the brothers of Kieran and Grant. Well, they're all brothers, obviously. But this is going to be a really awesome chat today. We're going to dive deep on some different things about Alluvium, where it's kind of headed in the future. As we know, 2023 is going to be a huge year for Alluvium. Let's put it that way. Um, and we're going to dive a bit deeper into land as well and kind of how the fuel system works how we, it might be able to change in the future and different things that we need to consider. And we're, we're going to just discuss that at, at more length today because I know it's a bit contentious in the community and not everyone quite understands how it works, including myself. <laughs> um, and we're going to dive a bit deep. So we'll start off with some pretty basic stuff and then we'll keep getting deeper as we go along. So firstly, and I'd love, to, I, I can't wait to get your opinion on this. What are you mo most excited for in 2023? Like, is there a particular game in Alluvium that's really... <laughs> mm. I think there's a lot of things to be excited for for us. We have a lot of planned releases this year. So I think getting through all of the releases is probably <laughs> the, the main thing for me. I've been going pretty hard now for over two years. And I think that it's it's required for, for us to really go hard and, and, and get it all done. And while we won't stop once we've released everything i think that'll take a little bit of that pressure off of us once mm. we get everything released to the public so that then we can recuperate regroup and come back reinvigorated and then you know fix up anything that needs to be fixed and then start to look towards the future of what are the next plans the beauty about it being a decentralized organization and having everything need to go through approvals means that even if we might have things on the agenda, we can't actually do them until we get approval from the community to do them. So there, there are some other games that we would like to start. There's some mm -hmm. upgrades to the existing games that we would mm -hmm. like to do, but we really need to let the community see what we've got before we can make that final decision. So until then, we mainly are just going to be focused on polishing. So, so yeah, for, for me, it's about getting through that big glut of releases that we've got this year and hopefully coming through on the other side of it uh, in good health. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's so much to look forward to. And this might be going a little bit too deep and be a bit too, more, too loaded, but... After the open beta comes out now, let's not put a time frame or a, a date on it or anything like that. After it comes out, do you think it will see any sort of major expansion within about six or 12 months or something? Like, when do you think the, the other four regions, because they've all been blocked out now. So that's really, really exciting in itself. It It's hard to say exactly because it depends on what people mean by expansion. Mm -hmm. So for me, all seven regions is not an expansion. That's mm. just the, the release of the game. So we have a set list of priorities for each of the games that we want there to be before it can be considered not just a public beta, but uh, just a finished game. Mm. And that includes having all of the regions. It includes our matchmaking system. It includes mm. tournaments. It includes rankings and ELO for the arena game. It includes getting everything up to speed that is required for land and mm. the Illuvium Zero game, et cetera, et cetera. So what those games are, at least whatever the, the genre is that we're calling them, it isn't an expansion to get that to be <laughs> right. That's just getting the game done. So the open beta is about getting the bare minimum number of connective pieces that allow mm. us to function. And will it be as good of a game as someone who's releasing their title, you know, on, on Steam as like a, as a proper full on game and people spending, you know, hundred, 200 bucks on it, uh, probably won't be that fully featured at that mm. stage. It, it's still by being open beta, there's still elements of it that we want to complete and, and, and get to a really polished state. So it could be that after that open beta, there's still maybe 20% polish 
to each of the regions to mm. get them done. It could be that we go through and make a really nice interactive tutorial system. It could be that there's more connections between the user interface elements and the things that we already have online, such as staking and the marketplace, right? Like we don't have plans for all of them to be in the game because you can do them outside of the game on the website. Mm -hmm. But eventually the idea is that there's a marketplace, it exists as a real thing inside of our game. So therefore, while you're in at least some of those games, you should be able to do it. We have plans for a game launcher, which will be like the seamless way to install and update and do all of these sort of things. These, these are all part of what we would classify as taking us from open beta into it's not a beta anymore. It's just <laughs> Alluvium the game. What I would consider to be an expansion would be something like for say Illuvium Zero, making it a bit more similar to something like Clash of Clans or mm. taking the overworld game and replacing the auto battler combat and adding into the game just full on open world combat. That would be, you know, getting it to a to a different sort of level, you know? Mm -hmm. Another expansion would be, you know, doing something like Mega Cities for Alluvium Zero. There's all of these extra things that we would like to do for each individual game that would be considered expansions. So I would say there's probably not much chance of getting expansions within six months mm -hmm. of us going live. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to be working on a lot of stuff. That that first six months after the open beta is really about getting the game up to the polish where we can be proud and say, mm -hmm. this is a fully featured game. If we stopped working on it now, people would be just as happy with our game mm -hmm. as any other game that they play that doesn't have an early access label on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's something about early access that, that can be a, can be a bit interesting. Sometimes some of my favorite games are in early access and I'm like, damn, I can't wait till they have all the pieces like fully put together. And I think Alluvium is going to be a little bit like that, but um, I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes in the future. And there's there's so much to it. Um, and you talk about the Monster Hunter kind of stuff with the Alluvials roaming around. Did you play much Monster Hunter? A while back? I, oh, have, really? I've, I've played, uh, I don't know, a, a moderate amount of Monster Hunter. I've played uh, a little bit of Dauntless, which I mm. found to be quite quite a good game. There's also other games that are not really Monster Hunter, but have a similar sort of a vibe. Zelda Breath mm -hmm. of the Wild is a great example of, of something similar to what we want to try and do, mm -hmm. where you've got these you know giant obstacle like boss monsters in the world and then other smaller ones. So even something like Zelda Breath of the Wild would be a good example of the, the style that we're going for in terms of what the gameplay is. Mm -hmm. there, there's... There's a lot of games out there that are open, open world combat based games. I think people get the idea of what we're going for with them. What we what we're really hoping to do though is to to do it in a way that is, I mean, good. You know, there, there are a lot of open world games that I've seen where very little attention is paid to the animations and mm. how the characters work in the game. You know, you'll have characters that are on a, on a slope like this and you'll see their feet sitting 20 <laughs> meters up in the air. And it, and it just, there's just something about that level of immersion that takes you out of the game a little bit for me. And so it might take us a little bit longer to do rather than just, you know, chucking things in the game. We already have all of the movement mechanics to get a really basic version of that done with all of the alluvials, but the problem mm. is that in a normal game you have maybe say two to four different skeletal meshes. Like you might have the humanoid mesh, which is, you know, like a, a spine with yeah. two arms, two legs and a head. And then you may have something like a canine sort of a skeletal mesh, which is, you know, four legs and and then a tail, right? We, we have canines, we have squids, we have birds, we have, I, I, I think we're calling the, uh, the axodon a, a satyr because it's got like a different shaped uh, foot at the front. So it's a bit more like those sort of um, mythological creatures. I think I calculated once when we originally did it, something like 15 or 18 separate 
skeletal mesh types. Damn. And that's just <laughs> a massive amount of extra work. It's, it's, it's by far bigger than almost any other game that, that exists. Mm -hmm. The reason why we went into that is because at the time we were thinking it's just going to be about the combat. We want to get that done. And doing that on a flat plane like our battle boards it's not easy to have that much animation, but at the very least, you don't need to think about kinematics. You don't need to think about having different slopes and stuff mm. like that. So for us, going that next step and putting them into our world, which is very vertically based, right? There are huge mountain tops. There are crazy big obstacles in the game. Like you look like this compared to things that are this big in, in our game, which does allow there to be quite a few more challenges in terms of where different alluvials could fit inside of that world mm. plus we have the the whole like you know what are the monsters that people are going to be fighting they're going to be very big so we're going to need to have some open areas for them it'll definitely take a while to get all of that stuff done but we want to do it well and obviously we'll do some early access for that and give that to people early mm. on so that they can trial it but we we tend to operate on the philosophy of not just chucking things in there and just letting it be whatever it is because first impressions last and we want everything to feel to at least some extent quite good. We're maybe a little bit less precious about it when it comes to user interface elements and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. These core mechanics of the game, such as our movement and all of the different uh, boots and stuff like that, are super, super important to us. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that they feel really good. And this would be another super important mechanic to put into the game. So yeah, it, it, even games like Elden Ring, if you, you go through and play them, almost all of the characters are all humanoid based. Right, they they do have some dragon based characters and stuff like that, and that's that's great. But for us, we have a hundred and fifty six separate alluvials in the game. Technically, it's I think two hundred and six. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 so much to consider, but I do like the idea that it makes the characters or the alluvials more unique. And then when you make more of them, you can start to rely back on these meshes and things. And, and you can keep that roster staying as unique as possible. I think, I, I know you don't, you're not super into Pokemon, but it's very easy to notice that the Pokemon franchise slowly got less and less, <laughs> less and less interesting as they kept mm. designing them, right? They recently yeah, yeah. them, so, you know, I, but. I still follow it. And I, I've definitely <laughs> noticed that, that, you know, they have gear Pokemon and stuff. And it's just like. <laughs> I'm not sure that is particularly iconic. Maybe that's the idea. Maybe the fact that it's so out there is what makes it <laughs> iconic. But for, for us, the, the plan for future sets is mm. definitely not to extend that you know, number of meshes because it's just mm. ridiculously hard to, to come up with uh, you know, different rigs and, and things like that and animate them. So I think you'll find that we'll start to fill out the space a bit more before we start expanding the mm. space on the alluvials, just purely because we do have a plan to add this monster hunter style element to it. And every new character that we bring in eventually needs to go into that. So mm. I'd rather take the existing characters that we have, get them working really well. And then when we make a new character say, how can we make it such that there's not that much integration work to make it go into the game? That's definitely going to be a way for us to help optimize it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, game development is actually one of those skills that I really want to learn in the future, especially the mesh stuff. I think I like the skeletal meshes and stuff. That can be really fun. So we'll move on to PvP now. We won't spend too much time on this, but I get a lot of questions about PvP all the time. So are there any details you can reveal for me or like, how is it progressing? Do you think it's too far away or? I, it's not, it's not too far away. We, we have an internal build where we can play in what I would call sort of a, a ruleless format mm. at the moment that we're iterating through. So at the moment we effectively get to make up the rules <laughs> that we want to play for, for that given say week and cool. trial it out, play each other, find out where all of those interesting little pieces come. We're not going to specifically hone in on one thing and say, this is definitely exactly what it is. We put it into the game and there's no changing it. Obviously that doesn't sort of mesh with our ethos of being a game that is you know, relying on the, the community to help us guide the, the project, mm. but we still have to trust ourselves 
a lot of the way to get something that we feel to be where that we're confident people will be really happy with. And that requires just a little bit of time for us to go through and, and, and try out different things. There are certain things that we are, are fairly set on. Like, for example, we're not planning any game mode that is similar to TFT, which is more that poker style mm. where everybody goes in and it's a random deck in the middle that everybody is is using. Because again, poker, TFT, those sort of games, they don't require any ownership. You don't go into a casino and mm. bring your own cards. They have the cards for you. That's how TFT is set up. That's how Dota Underlords is set up. Ours is much more similar to something like Hearthstone or mm. those style of games, Magic the Gathering, where you have to bring in your own stuff in order to play. And that really does fundamentally change the way that strategy unfolds in the game. And really the, the area that we are similar to those other auto battlers is just in how the battle unfolds, mm -hmm. being that there is a, a board, you place your characters, and once the battle starts, they start bashing each other, right? <laughs> that's, that's basically where we end in terms of our similarities. So you'll, you'll find that there'll be definite areas that are much more similar to card games, except instead of it being that, that standard card game where it's got, you know, like a damage point on it and that you have those mm. individual interactions. It's just a board that just goes nuts. And like we've always said, we want it to be more of a cinematic auto battler. Mm. So that's why we've always given you the ability to get the camera zoomed in right there. So you can see that Doka punching someone straight in the face, see the hit reactions. There's a lot of things that we have in there that are very subtle that aren't in those other games, just purely because we want people to feel how real it can actually be. And as far as the actual gameplay goes, the, the, the main tenets that we're looking for at the moment is we definitely want to stick to one versus one. Mm. We definitely want to stick to the, the health system that we've built in, which is actually a little bit similar to if people have played something like, you know, Dota Underlords TFT, where mm. at the end of a round, yeah. how soundly you beat your opponent determines how much damage you do to them. So the idea is that there won't be a fixed number of rounds where it's, you know, like win three and you're mm -hmm. the champion. It will be destroy your opponent's drone only temporarily, not, not fully. <laughs> and so you, you've got this, this idea of drone health and that allows there to be a lot more nuanced strategy where you can play a lot of your characters up front and, and show your board strength and do a lot of damage to them on the first rounds. However, you have less opportunity later on to change up what you do. So you're broadcasting yourself to the opponent just a little bit more. And if you do that, then they can come back and counter you. And remember, once they start to counter you, if they win the round, they don't lose any health and you lose some of yours so they can sort of whittle you down. And mm. battles could take multiple rounds. We don't want them to be like super long. We'd like someone to be able to get in there and have a, a game that is somewhere between five and 10 minutes. Oh, okay. That seems to be about the, the sweet spot for uh, two people to be playing against each other. Very similar to something like... Uh, blitz chess where you go yeah. in there each player has three minutes on the clock matches tend to last around about five minutes then mm -hmm. you move on to another match and you keep going we want people to finish the match win get a little tiny bit of elo boost you know move their ranking up and constantly be trying to get to the top of the ladder but as you go up in the rankings you'll start to be matched up with people that are getting to be much better players than you and have a much better understanding of the difference between different types of deck. And at the start, you might be able to say, you know what, I've got this cool standard deck that I play, which is very synergistic. It's mm -hmm. maybe all fire and it's quite powerful. But then all of a sudden you come up against someone who sees that you're starting to go into fire, counters you with some earth characters, and we really want that to be a strong part of the game, that countering system, so that you can feel like your choices really matter. If someone picks fire and you pick earth, the fire can still win, even though it gets countered by earth. However, there has to be a lot of extenuating circumstances in that. If it's just 
fire always beats earth. <laughs> Even though earth is supposed to be the counter, that's just not balanced at all. And so yeah. we'll, we want people to get those rewards where they sacrifice what I would call their board strength in order to defeat the opponent that has been put in front of them, right? To, to effectively sacrifice 20% of my power to take your power down by 30%. <laughs> And that should allow there to be a lot of interactions in there. Mm. And then at the top level of the game, it will be the interactions between two people who are roughly the same sort of power levels. They both counted each other just as much, but this guy is just positioned a little bit better or this person mm. has picked, you know, may maybe earth is the right counter, but did you pick the right earth character? Maybe you should have picked, you know, Tater P and instead you pick Scarabok and maybe that was the bad choice. And remember that there's not just the, the affinity countering, there's also the class countering as well. So it's quite nuanced because all that affinity does is it just charges up your ability to go hyper. Mm -hmm. And then as you go hyper, that power starts to manifest by your class. So you can choose to counter someone on the class level, on the affinity level, on the positioning level, or just on a character versus character interaction where, you know, Scarabox is actually quite strong against something that's got a channeled alt. If mm. you can position it well and hit someone and, and stop their channeled alt just before it really gets going, then you, you've, you've definitely improved your chances of winning the game. So that, that's the general idea is that we want people to be thinking about the opponent that they're playing just as much as they're thinking about building their own deck. Because if the most powerful thing is just building your own deck, well, then it just becomes pay to win. And everybody just says, okay, well, these five cards are the strongest. I'm going to get them. It becomes a little bit boring. Yeah, I, I love how excited you get over the gameplay. Because I know you've, you've done a lot of your, you put a lot of your heart and soul into designing this entire structure. There's there's so much to it. It's not like anything else. So I, I like how excited you get about it. And I'm, ex I'm excited to see it come out. I'm excited to... PvP is obviously going to be a big shift in the entire Reluvium ecosystem for a variety of reasons, but I, I can't wait to get my hands on it. Can't wait to play you as well. I think that'll be a lot of fun. Hey, so so just just to be very clear, unless I start training against the the best bots that we have, which everyone will have uh, access to, okay. I will definitely not be the best in the game by a long way. <laughs> and I mean, I, I only got to master in tft so there's a whole the whole professional level above me that is way way better <laughs> and you will have to train a lot because it won't be good enough to understand countering classes and affinities it won't be good enough to understand that you know the synergies how and how they work together it's about all of those nuanced pieces coming together mm. and finding those tiny little places in between the gaps and that won't be me because I'll be busy building the game. But <laughs> the thing that I get the most excited about is the overall architecture of the system. Because to me, if we can make the, the overall mechanics really strong, then the gameplay itself should start to emerge. So I actually don't want to get too heavily involved in the day-to-day -day of, you know, adjusting one character and then adjusting a different character, stuff like that. This is why we have AI to do a lot of those balancing pieces. Our job is to make a fundamentally good structure for everything. And then everything else should just emerge out of that. Mm -hmm. So, so on the AI stuff, a lot of people have been asking me, what I simply want to know is we understand that there's going to be an AI that essentially tests all the alluvials and how they play against each other and things and, and auto balances the game. Right. Mm -hmm. Have you have you guys started working on that? Do you know how difficult it's going to be? Is it going to? What I'm trying to ask is: Is it going to be ready when the open beta is ready? So we we started that about a year and a half ago, right? <laughs> there we, you we, go. So, so the it, it's 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 interesting though because with with this type of AI, the way that it works is you must give it mm. the parameters and the the I guess the reward functions that match the way that the game actually plays. And we don't have that yet, right? Mm -hmm. So when when open beta comes along, there will be a game mode that we will start to balance around. 
up until then, the way that we balance it is on trivial things such as the survival mode, right? Now, balance for survival mode is fine, but it's a fundamentally unbalanceable game hmm. because you're really playing against an AI that is showing you their entire hand before you start. So it's actually, I would say, you know, two orders of magnitude easier to become good at that mm. game because really you don't need to think about, uh oh, what if my opponent pivots and stuff like that? We are adding extra things like that into the game later on to make survival mode much more compelling, mm. but it was mainly about showing the battles and stuff like that. So we haven't worked a heap on changing survival mode. That'll be for later on and, and, and enhancing it. But what that means is that we can't balance the game the way that we want to because once you let an AI start playing it, it'll only beat the game that you put in front of it. And if that's not the final game, that AI is not going to be specialized, right? Let's say in the final version of the game, we take out one tiny thing or remove a character or anything, that AI will suddenly be garbage because it will have this idea that I need to play this character or I need to do this strategy. It won't matter because that thing is no longer in the game. So when I say we've been developing it, what I really mean is we're developing the, the necessary infrastructure. Mm. That goes back to the game itself is built on a deterministic model. Mm. So every time you play a battle, if you happen to have the random seed that mm. gets generated at the time the battle begins, then you know exactly how the battle is going to unfold. It happens exactly the same way every time, as long as you have access to our code base and, and understand how each individual part of it interacts. There's no randomness there. Then, then you have to look into the position of the units, which unit goes first, et cetera, et cetera. Once you've got all of that done, then you can actually let the battles unfold and, and, and play out, right? And we've got all of that done then there's the 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 fact that it's data driven so that means that every alluvial really is a spreadsheet right mm -hmm. there's an engine in the background that says i'm looking for certain parameters mm -hmm. and when i know what those parameters are i will create the unit for you on the fly to do its interactions and in some games, they use a functional approach where all they do is the, the, the character is a bunch of functions and it runs through it. But at that point, it's very hard for an AI to balance it because it's very hard for them to go into those functions and know how that operates. Okay. For us, each character is literally just a spreadsheet, right? So things like all of its stats, they're a spreadsheet. That's very normal for most games. Mm -hmm. But then how it functions in the game, how it targets what its Amiga ability is, what its basic attacks are, how they all work. All of them are literally just a, uh, a variable and then a value and then a variable and then a value. Uh. And so the whole thing can be generated on the fly. It's one of the things that we want the community to be able to do. We've actually got a, a thing in process at the uh, progress at the moment, which is like a, a, a web page that you would go to, to build an alluvial. And it would say, you know, what is its Omega ability? What is its uh, attack ability? It can have multiple Omega abilities. It can have multiple attack abilities. How it cycles between those abilities can change, right? We have effectively hundreds of quadrillions of different alluvials that are potentially out there that mm. are just one spreadsheet away from from being made in fact you know i i, I gave uh, a, a totally different ai a bunch of our spreadsheets right they're, they're just json files which is just a, yeah. a yeah. way to get the, the the data in there and i i gave it to chat G, gpt and said to, <laughs> and said here are some of our alluvial files make your own one and because it's all a very structured data file, it was able to put out a valid character that could go into the game. It was a bit nonsense in terms of what it wanted to do, but I, I don't know. I gave it some you know, weird command like make an alluvial, but make it such that if someone was scared of the dark, they would be afraid of this alluvial. And it made like, I don't know, some nightmare thing that had like shadow strike and blah, blah, blah. But because the systems are very defined, it can just paste that out. We could make a thousand alluvials tomorrow and just chuck them into the game. 
obviously there wouldn't be any art that would yeah, go along yeah. with that, but you would have a, a, a data simulation that could run and, and put them through the game. So we can change the characters all of the time. We have our own simulation, which strips away all of the, uh, the, the, the um, graphic side of it. And just mm. make some little blobs, on the okay. Board. And, and they can just, and you can just go and watch matches, and then just little blobs go doo, 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 and and do everything that the normal match has. It exactly ends the way that it would if you watched it with the graphics, but it's just peeling away that graphical layer, and that allows us to run millions of battles all of the time, which allows the the AI to say I won or I lost, so I and and, and change those things. So that was set out from the very beginning that we wanted to do in the game. And that took a long time. It's one of the reasons why the auto battler took a lot longer to complete because we could have easily done it functionally and mm -hmm. got the game out maybe three to six months sooner. But now we have all of that groundwork done. In inputting the newer alluvials is so much quicker, like vastly quicker than what it used <laughs> to be. If you take out the art side of it, making a new alluvial, as long as we don't need to add a new module into the system, which pretty much we're done with, we've got all of the modules that we want to have mm. in there. It would take me to make a new alluvial 10 minutes, something like that. And then, and then it's just, and then it's just the art that goes on top of it. There's obviously a lot of balance that needs to go in there. There's also feel. You can't just have an alluvial be random. You want it <laughs> to fit into a particular space. And that's up to us as designers to get the feel right. Mm -hmm. But once we've got the feel right, we lock off all of those feel parameters and then say things like the damage that it does, how long does its beam last, exactly who does it target, does it target three or four people. All of those little parameters, they're just numbers, and we let the AI play with them and just go through and do it. But we won't get a balanced version of the PVP mode, Ascendance, which is where we want to balance it around until we have the final Ascendant mode. And we won't even have final Ascendant mode in the open beta, right? Because mm. we don't need it to be the final one. We need it to be the final one before we start doing tournaments. So the plan is that, you know, tournaments with prize money will come out maybe, I don't know, three, six months after the open mm. beta goes live. And that means that we've got that period of time to adjust how the game mode plays out and to adjust all of the alluvials. That's our big period to adjust it with lots of data from the community. So definitely don't go in there and buy Ram fire, just going Ram fire always wins. And then <laughs> we adjust it and now he's balanced and like, but I thought he always won, you know? <laughs> so once that gets done, then we can say that the ascendant mode is, is locked and it will change over time. I'm sure we'll add in little pieces over time, but I would say the amount of time it'll take us to get the AI to balance it once we do that mm. would be roughly on the order of a week, maybe less. You know, the, they got Alpha Zero to be able to become the best chess engine oh, in the world right. a few years ago. I think it used something like 18 hours worth of processing <laughs> to go from just knows the rules of the game and nothing else to better than I, I believe stockfish was the number one at the time so these things go really quick at the end it's it's like very very slow getting everything getting all your ducks in a row and then when you get everything right you switch it on and all of a sudden it just it goes from being absolute garbage to being you'll never beat it ever in the space of a day or a week or something like that but that's fine we, we don't want human players <laughs> to be the best ever we want the ai to always be better because that way it'll help you be able to train that's, yeah, that's mind blowing. There's, there's so much information there I didn't know beforehand. And I don't know if you've told lots of other people and other amazing things, but yeah, even, even that there's an AI you can play against. And it, for some reason that never really crossed my mind. Anyways, there's, there's really one only, there's really one other big question I had for PVP and this sort of stuff is I have concerns about the randomized stats. Now we don't know the state of Leviathan arena, let's just assume it's not there or if it's there, it's, it's not that incentivized. Right. So sure. that, that means that that randomized stats don't really have much of a place in the universe anymore since they're not used for the ascendant mode. Have you thought about other ways of incorporate? I mean, they'll be incorporated for future games, but have you thought about that further? Uh, yeah. So the, the randomized stats are a way to, allow each individual alluvial to feel slightly different where there are games 
in our universe that are competitive, it'll almost certainly be the case that we strip them away, right? For almost every game. I, I can't think of a, I, I'm not going to say definitely we will <laughs> always strip them away because maybe there's a reason. I can't think of it. And I would strongly suggest that there never will be because those randomized stats will represent slight variations in value, valuations of the units. Mm -hmm. And that makes it tilt towards pay to win, mm -hmm. right? And we very strongly want there to be havens in our system where skill-based players can go and play. And, and I think that that's super important, right? The, the, the reason why people, you know, love football while they watch the World Cup and, and, and things like that is because it's one of those games that is a great leveler. You go out onto an empty pitch with a ball and you can kick. You don't even need to have shoes on or whatever. And you can just get better through your skill. That is an important part of our ecosystem that we should allow people to go in with minimal investment. Now, to be fair, I definitely don't want to say none because <laughs> it will absolutely be the case that if you come up against a decent player with a large deck and all you have are the tier zero alluvials, you're probably not going to win. I mean, there'll be a point where there'll be some rich person who's really bad and there'll be some person who doesn't have a lot of uh, stuff in the game who's really good and that person will win. And it'll become quicker than you think, right? That, that, that cutoff point is there. That's why Leviathan mode exists for those bragging rights of crazy mm -hmm. high-powered matches where you've got those randomized stats. But there needs to be this space where people can feel like in our universe – you can go through and do it without needing to outlay large amounts of cash. And that should be the case for all of our competitive games. The reason why I get a little bit um, skeptical about the randomized stats not playing an important role in the world, they absolutely will play an important mm -hmm. role in the overworld, right? In mm -hmm. those encounters. Overworld doesn't have any planned PvP games. So even when it becomes Monster Hunter, when you bring your character to help you out and, and beat some large thing, having a very you know maxed out ram fire is going to be of very large importance to you. Because mm. remember, mastery points don't come into those randomized stats. That's just free power for you. There's also the uh, the ranger level plays into it ranger level will determine how many mastery points you can play and hold at any given time that is normalized as well in the ascendance arena but it's not anywhere else if you go and play against your friends in a kart racing game then mm. they should be stripped away if you're playing time trials and competition but if you're just playing some zany you know crazy <laughs> battle mode then absolutely that ram fire should go into that game and, and, and start to be fairly powerful. Once people see that there's a large ecosystem there and that one string that determines all of your random stats gets used everywhere for all different sorts of games, I think people will start to see that it is very important. It'll allow you to level the characters up quicker, which is important mm. if you want to fuse them. They have to be above that threshold level. So there's a lot of areas where those stats will be impactful. But if you're the sort of person who only cares about Ascendant mode, well, then sure. If, if that's the only reason why you go come into our whole ecosystem is just to play that, then yeah, then those random stats aren't going to matter to you at all. And in those cases, if you wanted to buy something off of the marketplace, then <clears throat> just find the one with the weakest, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not going to affect you at all. And that's a good thing, right? That means that there'll be cheaper versions of things that are great for you, right? For, for your use case, just go in there and get like, a zeroed out ram fire and maybe that one's <laughs> half the price of a maxed out. I don't know. Maybe it's triple or double. Or anything. <laughs> so it just gives people a lot of different ways to go in there. I think, I think the, the overarching thing that I would suggest for people to consider is this whole game, this whole universe has been built on from the ground up on the idea of emergence, which is 
make simple systems, right? All of our systems, mm. when you look at them, I can teach anyone any system inside of our game in a couple of minutes. We have a lot of systems though. And when they start interacting with each other, it'll take on a whole you know, mind of its own and you'll just be able to see that, hey, random stats do matter for this. And there'll be things that we can't even predict that will become important for those reasons. It could be that there's some way to level up your ranger, but only if you have a character that has high stats because you take them into this game or that game. Who knows, right? But they will definitely be important. And I don't, I mean, I would strongly push back on anyone who says, allow ascendant mode to have those randomized stats mm -hmm. because the second you do that and you put it in the hands of good players, getting a 2% advantage is enough to absolutely destroy someone. And that should not be the case that someone gets to buy something for say double the price, get that 2% advantage and then go on and win because it just forces all of the tournament players to only get maxed out stats items. And, and I don't know that, that feels bad to me. Maybe the community differs and, I'm not on the council, so feel free to put whatever you guys want forward. I can't do anything to stop you. I'll go with what the community suggests. All I can do is just put my opinion out there that I think that that would be a very bad idea. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've always agreed with removing it from the competitive side of play, although I think it would be interesting. And I think the only other alternative I could see personally would be if you have it on a diminished scale, for example, if your stats range between 30% buff or whatever, but in Ascendant, they were like 5%. They all got scaled down or something. That could be maybe interesting, but but you're right. Keeping it as level as you can is, is obviously ideal. I, I would say the difference between Djokovic in <laughs> and the next guy is probably less than 2%. Yeah. And yet most people playing the game right now have exactly zero Grand Slams. He has <laughs> 21, maybe maybe 22. There can be a huge difference out of very small things. And mm. those small differences should come from, you know, up here. They should be the difference between two people in terms of their intelligence and their strategy and their risk aversion. All those sort of things are really mm. great. They're what make games awesome. If someone comes in and is like, hey, he really put everything on the line by spending a thousand dollars instead of five hundred dollars on this card mm. that doesn't feel good to me and i think that people will the best players will always find even the most remote advantages to be enough to to, to beat everyone uh, maybe the other thing that people don't realize is that there is a there is a, a competitive leviathan plan it mm. will have a ranking yeah, yeah. as well right so when we say ranked mode uh, ranked mode is for a lot of games, right? If we were to do a kart racing game, that would have a ranked mode. Ascendant has a ranked mode. Leviathan has a ranked mode, right? <clears throat> ranked just means you go into a lobby and you have a certain rating and you can play. So if you want to be the number one Leviathan player in the world and you spend $16 trillion on your deck to just absolutely just max out and you hire the best pros in the world to teach you how to play. You could be number one. That could be very prestigious. I can imagine that being very prestigious. It's, it's probably, I would say it's the equivalent of something like football, where it's really down to just pure skill and the, the person themselves versus Formula One, or at least the way the Formula One <laughs> used to be, where money absolutely matters, but you still have to have a good driver. So I would say that the Leviathan arena will be very similar to that in the sense that you got to have some decent cash to be able to get the best deck, but you still have to be very skillful. So I, I think there's some, some, some play for those randomized stats to be in there. I just don't want there to be that pervasive need for it because otherwise what we've been saying from the beginning that we, we want there to be areas where it's not pay to win that that sort of starts to become a little bit untrue and that just feels wrong so so just on that we'll start jumping into the land stuff because i know we've really got to cover this so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get straight we'll get straight into the deepness of it um obviously alluvium zero is the ideal is interoperable with alluvium overworld and the rest of the universe in the way that it generates fuel for the overworld right 
Mm-hmm. So you generate your Krypton, Solon, or Hyperion on your Olivian Zero land, and then you can sell that to the open market. And the idea is that you will get about 5% of the revenue from the main game or from the main game's fuel purchases more specifically, mm-hmm. and 5% of that revenue will go to the land holders. So mm-hmm. how does this system currently work? Because with land say you can generate a hundred Krypton a day on a T4 mm-hmm. land and every T4 kind of works the same, right? For the, for the most part. Sure. So everyone can generate a hundred fuel a day and then yeah. maybe they generate a thousand. Mm-hmm. But what if people yeah, it doesn't are matter buying, what, some, some what, what if, yeah, what if people are buying 50,000 Krypton every day? So h- yep. how do these sorts of okay. interactions work? And so, there's lots of people that need that answer. That, that really gets to the heart of why I think that a rail system is not good. Uh, When we originally came up with this idea, when we started talking in the community, there was this very large pushback that, you know, real gamers were going to see a fluctuating price and say, I'm out. There's no, like my brain can't wrap my head around the idea that if I buy something today versus if I buy it tomorrow, it could be slightly higher or slightly lower. I think that's... (laughs) beyond ridiculous but that was the pushback that that came out that these people would just be like unless everything is an exact fixed price then like my whole universe is shattered and i'm going to go sit in the fetal position in the corner i won't be able to play your game i just think it's ridiculous uh but because it was such a push i was like okay well there is a way that we can make a system so that there are rails where if it gets above a certain price we have an action to do that. Balance of pools have, and, and again, it doesn't need to be the balance of branded pool, but this idea that there is a, a pool that can have multiple tokens in there, that's probably the better way to describe it. Mm-hmm. Multiple token pools have this ability to either take out or input extra tokens to manipulate prices, right? And what that means is as the price gets towards the high end of the spectrum, that means that there are fewer tokens. This is the example that you're talking about where not many are getting input into the system and a lot are getting extracted out. So the price goes up. In that situation, you need to add additional tokens into the system in order to make that flow, right? And the current plan is that rail will be done by the DAO inputting extra fuel, right? So it'll automatically say we've hit the rail, Therefore, we have to keep on adding fuel every time it goes above, right? So if it goes above by 0.01, it'll just put in a little bit and more and Mm. put in more. Mm. And it'll basically keep it at that rail until it goes down. The problem with that for the land holders is that when that fuel is put in, that will uh, trigger that, that there's a transaction, right? They're, 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 they're effectively mm. selling fuel on and extracting ETH out. That will go to the DAO, which then gets distributed to ILV holders, right? So that difference it will be missed out on by the land holders, right? Which is why when we originally uh, put it out there, we said that if it goes above there, then the land holders can miss out on some of those revenues. So it's really only approximately X amount, right? The the way to counter that, if it's happening too often, right? If, if it keeps on going above the rails is to increase the production value in the game, right? Mm-hmm. So the idea would be that, like you said, they're, they're producing a hundred. All we would do is just crank up that value so that now they're producing 110 and that help hopefully balances it it doesn't mean that those landholders will sell that fuel they could still pot stockpile it but there'll be more and more stockpile so that the the natural trend will be that more will flow in which means less needs to flow in from the dow all that that means is that it'll keep that system functioning so that they do get their five percent but the problem is that there's effectively two manual even if they're automated there's these they're these two course correcting transactions, which is we didn't hit the right price point. So therefore we first had to add in extra fuel, which is not ideal. You want to have fewer and fewer transactions in these systems. You want it to be set and forget Mm. as much as possible. And then on the other side, we have to increase 
the fuel production of, of land, but increasing fuel production of land has a lot of knock-on effects in terms of how quickly buildings can be made because you know some buildings do require fuel to, to do them inside of the game. That means that the balance of the game has to slightly adjust. And all of that is a lot of complexity, which in, in, in my case, I would suggest is needless, right? To me, what the community uh, were asking for was, hey, can you add a whole bunch of complexity to the game <laughs> in order to make it worse? <laughs> and in my opinion, the reason why it would be worse is because part of that, that emergent system is the price needs to be found, right? People say, well, what happens if traveling to a region is a thousand bucks? Well, if traveling to a region is a thousand dollars, then that means that yesterday it was $999, right? <laughs> and that means that while it was $999, what, what happened was between then and now, there was more demand to pay that price of travel <laughs> than there were, was fuel going into the system. If that was not the right price, then it would go the other way and landholders would be like, oh my God, I, you know, fuel is so valuable. Let's just cash in all of our reserves. We're putting everything from our, our coffers into the game and people playing the game are like, no, stuff this. I'm not paying $1,000 to travel and the price would drop down, right? So the only way that we get to 1000 <laughs> is if it was first 999 and before that 998, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same thing with like a, a token, right? It's the, it's the same idea. If a token goes from a dollar to $2, that means that there's been more demand to buy it than there has been to sell it, which means that people value it closer to $2. Now, in the case of uh, crypto tokens and stuff like that, there's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of things going up mm -hmm. and down and they do tend to fluctuate in prices. One way around that is to have a lot more liquidity in the pool so that any individual person has less uh, pull in on the system, right? Exactly. If you've got a system where there's like $1 of liquidity, then all of a sudden you take out one thing and the price can shoot up a billion times, but it's not worth anything because how can you sell it into the pool, right? You sell 0.1 of a token and the price drops down back to where it was. That's what a lot of people don't understand with prices is when prices spike, you still need to be looking at what the overall pool is worth mm. and huge price spikes in pools that are very low liquidity doesn't mean that everyone got rich because the second even one single person starts to sell, it course corrects really rapidly and, and drops right down. So we'll try and add as much liquidity as we can. I have some ideas on how <laughs> that can happen, but internally people hate the idea. I can't even mention it because people don't like it that much, but I think, I think that there are ways to get our systems to be even more emergent and free flowing. Um, I've always been a fan of the free market economy where it works, right? I mean, obviously there's some parts of it that doesn't work. Like I, I love that we live in Australia and we have access to, you know, universal healthcare and stuff like that. And that's certainly not free market, but it makes things a lot better. There's definitely a time to have rails where things are easy for people. A video game is not the place for, you know, that, that to happen. It should just be based on, on the way that things go. So if we were to remove those rails and the price goes above, well, then the price goes above, right? And it will go up until there is some sort of equilibrium where the people in the game uh, you know, buying those tokens at the same rate at which the landholders are putting them in. Obviously, we've got to do some testing to try and make sure that the starting price that we put mm. has as little variance as possible, right? If, if we start it and a year later, it's exactly the same conversion rate, then we've done an amazing job. <laughs> Obviously, that's not going to be the case. It'll drop, it'll go up, but it doesn't really matter. Even if it drops to the point where it, let, let's say that we were to say that going on a run was $5 and then 10 years later, it was five cents. All that that would mean is that there's very few people willing to buy it at six and seven and eight cents that's what it's worth, right? And the landholders are putting it in. Now, 
maybe by this stage, the landholders are just like putting in a massive amount of fuel and there's a lot of people playing the game. Maybe the revenue of the overall system is higher, right? It could be that at five cents per travel, you've got billions of people playing, whereas at $5, you've got 10 people playing. Right, And so the revenue might actually go up as the price drops because more and more people can get in there. That equilibrium will be found and it will be designed to maximize for revenue rather than being maximized for gamers feeling comfortable. <laughs> the, other, the other thing that I disagree with is we're trying to make something different. We're trying to do something that no one has done before. There are a lot of people that look at a crypto game and they say, okay, well, let's make a crypto game and just chuck NFT into the title. Well, you know, whoop de doo right? You haven't actually done anything. You just made a game. Now, maybe the game is still good, but at that point, just putting NFTs in the title means that you're exactly the same as any other game that could have mm. assets because you can trade assets using back-end systems and stuff like that, that's perfectly fine. What we want to do is build something that emerges from that. And the easiest way to do that is to have a full openness at all levels, right? Mm -hmm. At the governance level, at the marketplace level, right? We don't want there to be all of these invisible things that people can't see. We want it to be like very clear because if you do that and the price goes up, then what will happen is you'll see a news article where it's like, oh my God, someone has just absolutely dumped millions of fuel onto the market that they've been holding. They've got a mega city. They've got these giant resources. They've, they've got silos. They've got everything. And all of a sudden, they've just dumped it all at once. And the price for travel has now gone from 10 bucks. It's down to three, right? Like, I don't know if that's possible for one person to make it go <laughs> Let's say if it did, right, that would just cause an absolute frenzy where everyone would be like, oh, my God, I've got to get in there. I'm going to stockpile my fuel. They buy it. They take it. Now they can go on trips. It's cheaper. You got new people coming into the game where they're like, this is what I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for it to get to a price that I can uh, afford. So they get in and you get lots of you know, press coverage and lots of cool things happening outside. And it was one of the most interesting things that I saw about EVE online was that mm. you would constantly hear, and I wasn't an EVE online player, but I just loved looking at these news stories where it's like, this guy just infiltrated that and stole a million dollars worth of stuff. I'm like, hell yeah, that is amazing, right? In, in our game, we won't have the ability to steal your assets because they're blockchain <laughs> assets, but we want to have lots of interactions where what someone else does can affect you. If you are someone who is really experienced in the zero point forge and you use all of your efforts to forge items for people and, and you get that skill to be you know really good and you've worked out all the different ways to arbitrage the different tokens and stuff like that and you get really good at that and then all of a sudden this fuel gets dumped onto the market and it makes it way cheaper for people to start do it, you know, doing what you do, such as, you know, building out swords and gauntlets and all sorts of things, then all of a sudden you're going to need to panic and retrain your strategy and stuff like that. That is the point of these games. It's what makes them feel real. And that at the end of the day is the only thing that we're really trying to build is a system where when you go into it, it feels like a second world, not because it's called second world, not because there's VR, not because you get an avatar, which is a person or anything like that, but because actions that you take affect that guy, his actions then affect that guy. And you have these long chain reactions. And that's the sort of world that I want to be able to live in where it's like, it's like the normal world in all of those cool ways, but it's escapist because it's like this sci-fi fantasy world with giant plants that can, you know, eat you and all sorts <laughs> of great things happen. And you, you have that fun element of it, but then at the end of the day, you've got something that's grows and, and, and lives of its own accord, right? And that, that to me is where the, the true fun of the game is going to be. And it's where I don't see almost any blockchain game. And when I look at MMOs and they talk about, you know, you can have an impact on the world. That's been like the holy grail since the internet age. I remember with the first MMOs, it was like, 
It was really good for a while. They went up and there was EverQuest, Warcraft, all these sort of games. And then all of a sudden they started to dip a bit because that next step of making it feel real and having a real impact on the world was was not there. Now, I, I'm not saying that <laughs> next week you're going to go into our game and you're just going to be able to build a new mountain in our game and then everybody sees a new mountain. We're a long way from having certain aspects of an adaptable world that molds to your will and, and everyone works together on it. That that's like maybe a fifteen year plan. I, I have I have no doubts that we'll eventually get there, but for now we can do some cool things like someone hoarding all of the you know chromium in the world and spiking the price of gauntlets, and then when you go to play in our you know RPG game. Maybe that's like a really good strategy and no one has it. And then they're like, damn it, we got to come up with a new strategy. And all of a sudden, one guy buying a lot of one resource has suddenly changed the meta in a whole game. It's it's not everything, but that's some that's pretty cool, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I love the way you get excited. And I love I love this rant that's happening because I know you wanted to get this message out there. And and I agree with you for the most part, for sure. Like there's nothing like being able to have that impact on the world at large. And you saying EverQuest certainly brought back some memories as well. And I, I remember when I was, I think it was 15 or 16, even I tried to flip the market on Guild Wars 2. I don't know if you played that one, but well, I, I used to go in, I, I used I, to go and buy a lot of the Guild items that I think would be increased. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah. I, I was a lot better at Guild Wars 2 than probably any other game <laughs> in terms of the competitive side of it. Yeah. Yeah, I was never that good at it. I wasn't that deep, but I definitely found this point where I got to the market. I'm like, okay, I want to buy this and hope it goes up in price. And all these analytics tools online and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And I love playing that it's entire fun, game. Right? I, like, I, it is <laughs> super fun. That There is a certain group of people that want to do quest completion and you know, all, all of like that, that, that completionist mindset, they, they're the sort of people that will want to do, you know, collect all of the Illuvatars, right? They're the people that want to collect every alluvial there. Then there's this sort of people that are competitive and they want to play a competitive game. And then there's this other group of people that I would call like the, the arbitrageurs. I'm not <laughs> sure if that's the right word, but these people that want to look into the analytics of what's worth more and finding a way to, you know, like I, I love this, uh, th these, these video series where someone says like, I'm going to start with a peanut and I'm going to end with a Tesla. And they're like, they, they trade the peanut for a grape and then they trade the grape for a shoelace and they keep on up trading that arbitrage opportunity of finding those places of value and ending up with something way bigger is just we need to have that in the game for it to be really fun because not everybody is going to be the most competitive player. Not everyone wants to collect everything. There's, you know, my, my wife is very much into just discovering the story and just traveling around. Mm. You know, we've got that in there as well. You can go through the regions and all, all, all sorts of things. There's a whole story behind all of that that people will be able to discover over time. And we just want to make it something for everyone. Yeah, we, we talk a lot about in Alluvium, you can be whatever you want to be. And that's what every metaverse is striving to do. And I feel like putting a, like stopping that from happening in any way might be a bit dangerous. And and I even told you in our DMs, oh, in previous circumstances, when they didn't peg the price, it, the barrier to entry became too high. But when I reflected on it, and you could probably talk to this more if you wanted to, when I reflected on it, no one's ever really tried this before. No, no one actually has the big example people probably refer to is Axie teams becoming worth $700, but that's different. That's a very scarce NFT. This, this is tokens. And I mean, it's token price, right? And it's the same as all cryptos and they don't go up unless people are buying them, unless people want them. And it, it's so different in that way as just one main way. It's, di it's different in many ways, but well, there's so much to it. I think that there is a certain aspect of something like, say, Axie Teams where th there's speculation to it, which can boost the price, and that's, that's never going to go away. There will always be a difference between the real price and what people are willing to pay, whether it be low or high, right? Like it could be that something is perceived as not a good investment where it actually is or the other way around, you know, so undervalued or overvalued, there's always going to be that, that differential. But then on top of that, 
in a pay to win environment such as Axie, if you want to win, you know, winning allows you to do better things in the game. So it's almost like paying more and more becomes an investment, right? And it's only when you look three, four, five steps into the future that you realize this is just insane, right? Why would I do this, right? Now, it's smart for the people that can get out before it absolutely collapses, but it's a fundamentally different thing to there's a token that allows you to access something in the game world. And again, Remember, at the moment, we've got the overworld. That's the only place right now where you can use these tokens. But eventually, you're going to be able to use them everywhere, right? So the price of the token is going to be some sort of an aggregate of what it's used for across all of our systems, right? Remember, cryptons are not just going to be used for one thing. They'll be used in other games, and that will adjust the price. And it could be that they're worth it in one game and not worth it in another game. And that means that it gets a bit expensive to use it over here, but it's actually really cheap over here. So people use it. And there has to be this balancing act between getting everything to level out. The only way that you do that is to let the free market choose and barrier to entry will uh, either go up or down as the game starts to go. But the only reason it would go up is more people are playing or they see more value in it. And Underpinning all of that is we have free stuff in our game. You can go and play our game. If if all of a sudden the price goes up, just level up your dokers, you know, level up your fleece. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that you can do in our game. Go go play them in the in the tier zero time trial mode in our kart racing game or whatever, right? You they'll have there'll be a lot of things for you to do while the price is high. And basically you just need to say, I'm not getting involved in that, right? I'm not. I don't. I don't want to have the price be this high. I'm not buying. If most of the people agree with you, then there will be a lot less demand. And I mean, I don't know. There would have to be a lot of manipulation on the land side. And we've already seen that the amount of ability, at least of our community, to collude with each other is a big fat zero, right? They have <laughs> zero ability to work together on anything, right? So the idea that they're all going to work together and say, hey, the game players have stopped buying tokens. We're going to stop putting them onto the market. It's not going to happen, right? Like, I mean, they, <laughs> there's going to be someone who breaks and, and, and they're going to put their tokens onto the market. I guarantee it, right? And the other thing is that you have a certain amount of storage. So as you're gaining like what are you going to do just throw the fuel away right like you only have a certain amount of space there's a finite yeah. area to so once you get to that you got to imagine that there's going to be this flow of tokens going into the game so really the only thing in the long term that is going to affect this besides the the day to day day to day transactions is just the demand from the game and if the game starts to have less demand because fewer people are playing, well, then the price will drop. And then that should kickstart the demand to go up because now more people are interested because it's at a lower price. And it'll it'll find some equilibrium. As long as we give the pools enough liquidity, it's not going to adjust, you know, by large amounts. I mean, like if 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 I don't want to buy them at like a dollar per token, but I do want to buy them at like 50 cents, that seems reasonable. I don't think there's going to be that many cases where where it's like, well, you know, unless it is, you know, 0.01 cents differential from my thing, I'm never going to buy it, right? <laughs> Most people have, I don't know, 25% in them. And the idea that the average gamer will look at that and say, whoa, there's an exchange rate. I don't know how to deal with this. I just think that's nonsense. It'll just like, we, we should lean into it and say, this is what the game is about that's what makes it interesting that there is this free market that you can play. There were millions of people playing Eve online 20 years ago that love that idea. Hmm. Are there going to be some people that don't want to deal with fluctuations? Sure. They will either a wait for the price to be low or B just play a lot of the free stuff in the game. And that's totally fine. That's how most gamers play. And we, we expect that. I, th I think it's worth considering that the real world economy affects all this as well. And mm -hmm. why I say that is because if you denote something heavily in say USD, then you're actually going to, you're going to harm your game more than you help it. And what I'm saying here is that 
video game prices have gone up over time for the past decade. I mean, I've I've seen it a lot. I remember 10 years ago, games I could buy for 60, 70 bucks. And now they're costing over $100. I'm talking about Australian here. You guys that are mm-hmm. in America, I don't think it's over 100 for you guys yet, but it's over 100 for us and it sucks. Yeah, sometimes anyway, 120. Yeah, sometimes 120. But it's going up over time because the Australian dollar or the US dollar, or whatever, is inflating over time. And if you mm-hmm. peg, if you peg your price for, say, $1, and it's one dollar for the next ten years. Everyone else's games is they're going to be charging way more, and people are willing to pay that because they have more money. If you earn twice as much as you did ten years ago, but the price yeah. of this game is still the same, then you're leaving twice, twice the amount of money on the table in terms of revenue for Alluvium. And I think yeah. that's a really dangerous game to play. Yeah. And I think, I think the other thing to remember is that gamers are really, really against them being manipulated to spend money, right? Like they're re- like this is this is one of the biggest things that before gamers hating NFTs, they were hating loot boxes, right? And the <laughs> idea was that when loot boxes first came in, they were absolutely designed to be pay to win, right? You had mm. to have them to get better things. This is what people hate, right? The idea that a game can be funded via some randomized transactions that don't impact the game, such as cosmetics and things like that, I think most gamers are now perfectly fine with because you don't have to get involved in it. No one says that you have to be wearing a really cool skin to be able to win. In fact, some of the most iconic things are people running around in a game basically just wearing a pair of underwear and a pot on your head, right? And that's uh, (laughs) become like the most iconic guy. So... You don't need to. It just becomes a little bit of a flex that some people can do and other people uh, not. So the idea for us is we want to treat the gaming community fairly, which is to say we don't set the price. At least this is this is me. This is my idea. I'm not I'm not Alluvium. I don't get to decide these things. Again, <laughs> not even on the council, so I don't even get to have the final say in them. I just feel that if you say to gamers everyone's playing the game and if more people are playing and they're more interested in it, then the price can go up. Then the price will go up, right? It's not us that are setting the price. It's not us trying to gouge you. It's not us trying to do any of these things. And in fact, the community are the ones that earn the tokens and and, and hold them, right? They get that money back, right? So when it goes, when it gets distributed and goes back to the, the DAO, it's those people that are playing the game and are in there that, that get that back to themselves. So I, I don't think it's the same sort of feel as Ubisoft coming in and saying, hey, inflation's gone up. We can gouge people an extra 15% on these microtransactions. That feels to me fundamentally wrong because it's some marketing person saying, I, I've calculated exactly how much I can squeeze out of these people. I don't like that idea just like most gamers don't like it. I just rather the game be out there and it's just it's just two cryptons to do that transaction. Price of cryptons goes up, not by me. It goes up by you guys playing the game. If you're loving it, it'll go up. If you're hating it, it'll go down. And that to me feels like a fundamentally more fair system. And there's already an outlet for it, which is we have a free to play part of the game. Where you can go in and test it. You don't need to pay 120 bucks to go into the game and then go, <laughs> you know what? I don't like this game. Just go in. You can travel to all of the regions. It's not like you're going to see worse quality art when you capture our free alluvials. They're not worse quality. In fact, they're some of our best. They're some of our most iconic. And that will be the case with everything that we do is that there's always a way to go in and pay zero throughout your entire existence. And that's perfectly fine, right? If you just want to go go through and play, and if you're willing to level up, you have that chance to turn that peanut into that Tesla with no effort on your part. And to me, that treats gamers the way that they should be treated, which is just absolutely fairly. Yeah, yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. It's just, we're trying new things. Why mm-hmm. stop now? That's, that's pretty much the big part of that. Um, there's two more, I know we're taking a lot of your time. If you have a minute, There are two more really quick things I'd love to touch on. Firstly, Najaf did put forward a solution that I thought was quite interesting. So we'll we'll leave the land on this one. Um, Mm -hmm. But basically, his idea was to leave it... it, It's like a hybrid system. Essentially, one cost to travel is $1, let's say. 
but the fuel it's denoted in is varying so that everything kind of still makes sense. So that means that you're still always paying a dollar to travel so that the gamers get appeased or whatever like that. But it might cost 0.1 crypto on one day and 0.01 crypto on the next day. You know what I mean? And crypto will still change in price. But what do you think of a system like that? Do you think that's still too much control? I or huh? <laughs> I don't like it. I think, I think it does uh, exactly what I'm saying, but with more steps, right? Yeah, pretty much. The, Pegging it, having it be the the price is always the same inside of the game means that we peg it to a particular currency, and the reason why I don't like it is because it sets in place that there is a person who decides the price. Mm. Right now, it's on the back end. There's still this this system of the the price goes up and down, and and so your your value in the system can change. You know how many trips you get will depend, all, all it's doing is it's just splitting up when you buy versus when you sell just that little bit more. Um, I've only thought about it for literally the two seconds that you've just mentioned it to me, but I feel <laughs> like at every stage, what we should be trying to do is removing as many functions as possible, right? Keeping mm -hmm. it as bare minimum as you possibly can. Yeah. And it could be that that's the best idea, right? I, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm always right or that that is particularly wrong. I don't even have a very nuanced idea for why it's specifically wrong, but telling someone that it's going to cost them X amount, you know, it's a little bit of a sleight of hand there and that like they can think to themselves, well, I bought that yesterday and it was a different price, so I'm getting it cheaper and, and whatever. Really, they're going to be looking at it at the day-to-day -day price and it's going to be always costing them $10 to travel or $5 or a dollar or whatever it happens to be. And by doing that, someone's setting that and someone has to change it. And as you, as you say, as, as inflation goes up, you have to change it. And to me, it mm. just feels fundamentally like why, right? Like I, I get this idea that having something be fixed is what people are used to, I don't get this idea that unless things are the way people have known them to be, their brain is going to collapse into a black hole and they're not going to be able to function <laughs> in there. I just really don't. I think that people are so good at figuring out how new things affect them that that's where most innovation comes from, right? If we didn't have people putting out systems that are different, we wouldn't get all of these cool interactions that we end up getting. We just have, you know, a thousand versions of Pac-Man. And I, I, I just, I strongly feel like when someone goes into the game and, uh, and does it, as long as they understand that supply and demand are affecting those prices and it's not, you know, some fat cat sitting in an ivory tower saying, actually today you pay 10 and then you pay one and whatever. If these, if these are steady, slow transitions over time, we've found that like our target demographic is definitely people aged between say 18 and 45, you know, mm -hmm. like that's, that's the major place where sort of crypto and gaming sort of intersect. Not saying that uh, people <laughs> below that won't be able to play, but they probably, depending on their region, they won't be able to do anything with money involved in it. And uh, unless their parents sort of helps them out, but, but I guess that'll depend on each region mm. over 45s. There's definitely plenty of people playing games in that space, but they're probably not like that. They're fine. Right. I, I, I guarantee those people have no <laughs> problem with fluctuation. So really we're talking about a younger demographic between say 18 and 45 who have already shown like a massive amount of savviness with crypto and stocks and, and, and things like that. They understand the fluctuations of the price and they, 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 they get motivated by it and they see it's like, buy now, this is going to go to the moon, get in there early. You know, I feel that that's the, the best option. Again, I could be wrong and I don't get to make the final say on it. I just want to put out my opinion. And if I am wrong with that one, I'll be the first one to stand up and say, yep, I, I was wrong about that. And there's always the ability to change it down the road. I would just say, when building things, do the bare minimum first that you think can provide the result that you want and only add when 
it becomes very clear that you need to add on to it. So all of these ideas of rails or separating the price, or sort of like differentiating in different places, to me, it's like, let's do the bare minimum and make something cool. Let people play with it. If they don't like it, there's always the ways to adjust it. But why do all of the work of adjusting it by saying the simple won't work without actually trying it? Because if you end up saying, oh, this doesn't work out quite as well as what we'd like, what are you going to do? Just like strip out all of those systems and go back to the other way? Because you haven't tested out, you know, my way of doing it yet. So then it's like, <laughs> well, I, we're going to take all of this work away to go back and try out Aaron's system. Maybe Aaron's system sucks too. Maybe there's a third system that, that works there. Once things are done, there's always that, I guess, inertia with it. And I don't want us to be one of those games where we get stuck in a rut and it's very hard for us to change. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a simple solution here, Aaron, and you just tell everyone that the game's going to be ready three months earlier if you don't have the rails and it's problem solved. No. So the last thing I wanted to ask you really quickly, I had a few other questions, but this is the big one for me, is you talk, you've you talked about... <laughs> You've spoken about Iluvatars and a card game. Is there anything mm -hmm. more you can give me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can definitely give you. Uh, again, anything that I give you is not official because, again, <laughs> I'm not one of the officials. I'm just someone that puts forward ideas, right? We didn't start making Alluvium Zero until we went into the community and said, mm -hmm. hey, we're thinking about making a mini game. Throw some ideas out there. We let the community go nuts for about two weeks compiled a list of their all, all of their ideas and said, hey, it looks like the thing that you guys are mostly interested in is a simple city builder style game. I'll work on a proposal of what that could be, put it forward to you, and then people go and vote on it. So it's not like if I say, yeah, we're going to do a card game, doesn't mean it's going to happen. The What I can tell you is we want to make sure that the whole system that we do all has this underpinning of uh, two things, which are fuel, which we've already discussed, mm -hmm. and alluvials, right? Alluvials are the backbone NFT that is used across every game. Effectively, you could call every game as having a requirement of a deck. In Overworld, yep. your deck is your inventory, right? In Arena, your deck is your deck. If we were to have a MOBA game, then your deck might be your Q, W, E, and R skills, right? Mm -hmm. And you would have to configure that, which means you have to have some of those alluvials. If we make a card game, it has to be built off of alluvials, right? That is, in my opinion, 100% set. But we already have these cards called alluvatars, which are like an avatar for an alluvial, right? It's like an alluvial, but with a top hat or with a monocle, or with a scar, right? It's like a customized version of that alluvial. So why not merge them together? We can. We, we have some plans of things that we would expand for the Alluvatars game. And again, we're, we're thinking about changing the name of this collection system, right? The, this album. Yeah. Uh, to not being called Iluvatars, right? Iluvatars will be the name of the, the actual card yeah. because they're an avatar for your alluvial. Makes perfect sense. But the actual game might be something else. I, I won't throw out any names that we've we've gone through internally. It might be something that we throw out to the community. But the, the general idea will be that that will be given a, a name. Because that one sits outside of our law universe, because again, Atlas in the normal game doesn't have scars and top hats and stuff like that. That's not a real part of it. This is sort of like a, uh, another dimension, right? It's very similar sure. to like in, in league of legends, when you get a skin where it's like a pool party version of it, there's not a bunch of league of legends champions just sitting around in a pool party. It's some alternate universe where that happens. So almost, there's like an alternate almost universe. like an outer world. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Almost exactly like that. Kieran, right? Kieran mentioned it to us. Yes. So, <laughs> so the, the idea would be that we like all of our games have like this alluvium and then the name of the game sort of title. This mm. one, I think it'd be kind of cool to just call it ILV, right? So it'd be ILV and then the name, and that would denote that it's still 
part of alluvium, but it's not part of our core alluvium yep. universe. So if something happens in this game, you don't need to feel from like a, a canon perspective, you know, a lore perspective, that it's possible to have a top hat on a ram fire, right? So since we've got all of these components in there, the idea is, well, while you're doing the collection game, why not allow you to empower your collection with alluvials, right? You have the avatar, but you really need the underlying piece to empower them. And what better way to do that with, than with a card game? So the idea would be you've got this giant album where all of your collections okay. exist and you can get all of your collections by uh, collecting all of the different alluvatars, right? So for example, okay. there's one collection which we call the Axolotl line and it has nine cards on there. It's three Atlas, three Axon, three Axodon. And then in the columns, it's the, the common expression, the mm -hmm. uncommon expression and the rare expression, right? If you can collect all nine of them, you've finished the collection, right? So that'll all be the same, but we want you to sort of take your alluvials and empower them into the collection, basically like light them up so that they go from just being cards to being like active cards. And then now you've got this album that has your alluvials in there. And again, you won't need to collect them one for one. So if you have an atlas, that should be able to go into all three of your okay. atlases. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Atli, I'm not sure how to say the, the plural for atlas. I'll, I'll say atlases, <laughs> right? Um, so that'll allow you to effectively empower all of them, which means that you could choose them in your deck for a card game. Oh, right? okay. So the all idea right. is then instead of just having a card game, which is just alluvials, now you bring in a card game where you can either take the, the base one, which is effectively no accessories on it at all. Mm. And that is, you know, like a simple card. Or you can bring in a card that has a cane, a top hat, a little button, a background or whatever. And because this sits outside of the normal Alluvium universe, the idea would be then to make this card game a lot more wacky and zany. A lot of the mm. stuff that we do is fairly serious. You look, at, you see our cinematic, it's, it's, it's meant to be something that's fairly standard, fairly, you know, common sort of sci-fi fantasy fair it's not meant to be like all jokes and craziness it's got a bit of that in there but it's not <laughs> just wacky and zany this would be our chance to say there's all these other card games out there that are quite serious and, and stuff like that let's make our card game just off the walls bonkers right <laughs> so you know the the top hat on your atlas empowers it in some way that allows you to win and that's just like what the hell like why would a top hat make a difference but it might increase his fanciness by 10 percent or something you know what i mean like just <laughs> we, we haven't actually gone into the details of this because we would need to get this approved by the community but the idea would to have this be a casual card game it sits outside of the universe it seems like it fits so that there's a whole extra group of people that may never want to go into the arena game, but they absolutely want to go and play this this card game and 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 get all of the 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 perks and benefits of that. That could be the only thing that they know our universe for is just that card game. And that could be cool. And I, I, I've played a lot of different fun card games like Unstable Unicorns is is probably mm. one that uh, I think would be a good fit where it's like really zany. It it would be a challenge for us to build because we didn't make Aluvatars with this in mind at the beginning. And had we gone back in time, we probably changed some of the accessories mm. to, to, to be a little bit different. But we don't really have a chance to change the accessories now because there's been a lot of work gone into yeah. them. So it would be tough and it would require us to come up with something really cool. But that would be something that we would put to the community to say the collection game, which is sort of like a half of a game, Although to be honest, the the documentation on Aluvatars is actually, as of today, twice as comprehensive as the Overworld. Right now, that that's mainly because I'm very abusive to our Overworld team, and they do an amazing job without much 
actual like guidance. They, they just do a great job there. I'm actually in the process of uplifting the overworld. And I think I'm probably going to have to increase the documentation by around about five times, which will put it on par with arena at somewhere around about a thousand pages mm. worth of documentation, but <laughs> It's pretty comprehensive, Iluvatage, at the moment, and it'll just keep growing and becoming its own thing. And I think if that sort of becomes a card game slash collection game, I think that that sounds like a really good addition to the to our whole universe. And that would give us four games. I don't know when the card game could be released. It'd probably yeah. be sometime yeah. next year or whatever, but um, card games don't take quite as much time to build, but... Not once you've got all the art for the cards, right? We've got, yeah, we've got all of the art <laughs> for it. It's it's more about getting the design of it to be right. Yeah. And my my idea is maybe this is me just being cheap. <laughs> just if we make it zany enough and casual enough, if it's not perfectly balanced, then people aren't going to hate us too much. So don't expect this one to be the pinnacle of balance. <laughs> we'll probably use AI to, to balance things around it, but it's meant to be crazy and wacky and uh, zany. Unless the community says, no, we want an absolutely serious card game. We don't want it to be anything like that, in which case I'll just, we'll build what they want. No, it doesn't need to be serious. I think the, I don't know if you probably haven't played it and maybe you shouldn't. It's it's pretty average, but um, the new Sheba the, the SHIB team created okay. a card game on the mobile. Yep. Um, and it aims to be pretty, it's it's not super zany or anything, but it doesn't take itself seriously at all. So yeah. um, it's, a, it's a bit of fun. Roll your SHIBs or whatever in their funny costumes and things and you're playing yeah. with them. It's pretty yeah. wacky. And, yeah. I think, I think that would be good. I mean, for us, it's a little bit more tricky because we've got the Illuvatars, which are sort of based on Illuvials, right? So there's... Mm. There's going to be 156 of them in the first set. But then we have backgrounds. Each yeah. background has a tier and a stage. We've got accessories. There's five slots. And then there's tiers and stages of them. We have the different expressions, you know, common, uncommon, and uh, uh, rare. When you add all of those combinations up, you get to billions of combinations. So combining all of that with the random stats that we would have to put into the game, you know, you have those random stats in there. Um, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of different combinations there. So to get that to be balanced and interesting is, is gonna be a bit of a challenge. Again, like I said, if I could go back in time, knowing what I know now, knowing how cool that the Illuvatars themselves are going to be, I probably would have sat down with the art team and said, let's do a proof of concept of what this card game would be. And then you guys can make the accessories based on that. Really, we let them go and make the accessories based on what would be the coolest mm. from an art perspective, because it was mm. supposed to be just an art project at the time. But I think we can do it. It's it might be a little bit harder, but I, I think. We can. All right. Also, well, I've taken so much of your time today, Aaron. But I can't wait to share this with everyone. I'll share with, with them soon. Thank you so much for joining me. Is there is there anything else you'd like to say before we round this one off? There's. I think I think we've covered a lot of the things that the community are interested in. I'm probably going to be a little bit on a um, vow of silence. Uh, I, I won't be communicating with the community quite as much for the next few weeks, just purely because we're going into a phase where I have a lot of stuff that I've got to get done. I'm, I'm letting the teams down a little bit because I'm some of the work that I'm supposed to be doing is piling up. I'm working as fast as I can, but there's a lot of extra stuff coming on top. So I really need to just sit down and, and, and get all of that stuff done, get, get all of their ducks in a row. So you probably won't be hearing from me for a bit. That being said, if there are still things that people have as far as questions goes, they can feel free to ping in the community. Again, I'm not an authority on any of these things because they're just my opinions. It could be that the community hates what I want to do and does something completely different. All I can tell is the way that I see things and how I envisage this project growing into the future. There are probably, you know, 
I think we got like 200 people on the project that all have their own vision of what the thing will be. And we all work together to mm. try and make that come to fruition. I think I sometimes have a little bit more say in it than, than others, but make no mistake. There's a lot of people behind the scenes coming up with a lot of this stuff. It's not mm. just, uh, it's not just me. I, and, and so really the, the idea is we just need the community to come together and give us their opinions. I still think that, 50% of all of the opinions that people give are just absolutely insane and basically just uh, <laughs> crazy. But I still read them because if a whole bunch of people are giving the same insane opinion, it could be that maybe their, their, their outcome or the, the solution that they have is bonkers, but it really gets to the heart that there is some problem that either we're not communicating or we haven't built into the game or something. And they do matter, right? Like this is a very large mm. project. We have literally 19 products going on throughout this project, whether it be staking or governance or, you know, the, 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 all of the different games, the different backend pieces, the cinematics, there is literally 19 projects going on all at, all at once. It's a mm. lot of work for us to do. So please get all of your feedback in there and it'll slowly filter through. If your specific idea doesn't get implemented straight away or doesn't get acknowledged, don't think that it's not being looked at. I try to look as much as, as I can. But for me specifically, don't expect much communication for probably, I'd say, a month or so. And then, <laughs> then I'll probably be back to communicating a lot as we start to lay out a little bit more information about private beta three for arena and private beta two for the overworld and the next iterations for the mm -hmm. Illuvium Zero alpha plus Illuvitas. There's so much stuff going on at the moment. Like I said, I just, I need to really sit down and, and, and get it all done so that we can make the community proud of the stuff that we put out for you. Yeah. I mean, you got we've got three betas out at the moment and they're still so much better than everything else we see in this space and they continue to improve and continue to grow and i don't know i, I, I don't know if i thought we'd have three playable things out by now you know what i mean like it's moving so quickly and there's so much to do still but they're all incredible to play they're all incredible to experience and they're better than a lot of web 2 games as well so true testament to you and the team and there's so much, so much happening. I, I mean, I, I still think that there's a lot of new Web2 games coming out this year that will be fantastic that I'll be looking mm. at and trying to iterate on and, and, and us as a team. We'll keep pushing, right? The idea is that we're going into a space which is different to that normal Web2 space. We're trying to get as many people to see that it is a valid space mm. for people to play games. And possibly better in a lot of ways once that happens if we get that momentum the culture that we have inside of the team of everyone going hard of everyone working for each other and, and trying to improve of it being community run and having the contributors have some of the ownership of, of the product means that i i feel that as time goes on we will skill up We'll get better at communication. We'll get mm -hmm. used to each other. We'll become a better decentralized studio. So we'll just become way more efficient. And the speed at which we'll operate will get faster and faster. And if it hasn't hit the same level of Web2 games now, the, at least the best ones, it will hit them. And then it will surpass mm -hmm. them. And then we'll be able to iterate a lot quicker. And we will never have that fundamental feeling of, resting on your own laurels because we operate in a completely different way. Community ownership means that it will necessarily have to go forward. And if Alluvium Labs, you know, the contracted studio by the DAO to build these things, if we inside rest on our laurels, you guys flick us out the door and get someone else to do it who's willing to do it faster and better, the DAO itself, which is the most important thing, will keep on churning and it'll be crazy. I mean, there's there's a lot of 
zany things. There'll be lots of ups and downs along the way. But I think in the, in the long term, I really do trust the wisdom of the masses. And I think that it'll just constantly have this drive to get better and better all of the time. And in 10 years time, I really hope to be able to sit here with you and be talking about a 10th game and <laughs> so on and so forth. Who knows what the future will, will, will hold. But for me, I'm loving working on this project. I've never worked harder in my life. I've never had this much fun in my life. So, and I, and I think that there's a lot of people on the team that feel the same way. Mm. They're all just absolutely smashing it, working super hard and generally enjoying every moment of it. And we just try and get that to, to be better and better all of the time. And yeah, in a few years time, maybe we'll, we'll have something special. Yeah. Thanks for the chat, man. It's, it's absolutely incredible. I can't, I can't wait till we can do this again, but Put your head down, take the time you need. Um, we'll all be here waiting for you when you come back.